Good morning. Thanks for turning on the TV this morning or the computer, the, the iPad, whatever. Glad you're here. Um, I've got nothing to announce, no extra information to share. We're just going to get right into our time together in God's Word this morning. You know, Paul had to defend his ministry in a number of his letters, but the letter to the Thessalonians is no different. In our text today, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to walk through a passage where Paul is writing to defend his ministry to the church by reminding them of who he was and how he was when he was with them. You know, when, when Paul was ministering in Thessalonica and any of these cities, one of the things that comes through loud and clear from all of his letters is that his ministry team and, and him as the leader, but also those who were with him and those who he would send on his behalf, they operated in a way that was above reproach, above reproach in their character, above reproach in their dealings with the, the believers uh, in, the, in the different towns, and even above reproach in their dealings with outsiders in the different towns. But in Thessalonica, um, excuse me, in Thessalonica, it really does come down to his relationship with the church. It's kind of strange when you think about it from our vantage point that the Apostle Paul would have to write, and in writing, uh, that in writing, the Apostle Paul would have to defend himself. I always think that's a little bit weird because we have such an elevated view of Paul and who he is and, and the, the role that he's played both in history and, and especially in the shaping of Christianity. Um, carried along by the Holy Spirit of God in his writing, which has brought forth the, the gospel and the, the, the story of the church and the, the, um, our understanding of what the church is to be about in all these, in all these different letters. Such a singular person after... After Jesus, he is the most influential person in the shaping of the, of the New Testament and of the church. It's strange to think that he had to, you know, defend himself to the people that he had been ministering to. But that's because we don't really uh, immediately recall that in a lot of the places where Paul had left, he was followed by people behind him who opposed his ministry and his work. And it wasn't so much Paul that they opposed. They opposed the church, the new church in their town uh, for different reasons. And in Thessalonica, uh, you know, it said that, that the way that the leading Jews approached the, the city leaders was to say that these guys are turning the city upside down. And so there was dissettlement that came to the social order in Thessalonica as the new church got its start, got its root. And we talked last week, there was persecution in this church. Those that were uh, opposing Paul weren't so much opposing Paul as they were trying to destroy and stamp out the Christian church in, in this town while it was still young, kill it while it was not yet even out of infancy. And so to, to do that, they had to destroy the message. They had to destroy the message that this new church was formed and shaped by, which was the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And to destroy the message, they, they, they went after the messenger. And they looked to discredit him. He wasn't there to defend himself. They looked to destroy him in absentia. By destroying and discrediting him, they would discredit the message of the gospel. By discrediting the message of the gospel, they would pull the foundation out of the church. What they were doing was opposing the church. But the way that they did it was they were trying to tear down Paul in the ministry that he had had there. And so in, in any of the New Testament letters where you see Paul writing and it seems like he's defending himself, we might think, well, he seems like he's puffing himself up, but that's never the case. He's not writing to puff himself up and talk about how great he was and how wonderful his ministry was. It's never that. He's writing to repair with the believers what's being destroyed by those who oppose him. So that's the setting of what's going on as we come to our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Meet me there in your Bible or on your tablet, um, and we'll read from verse 1 through verse 12. Today what we're going to do, it's a little different than maybe normal, we're going to stop along the way. And so we're going to read a couple of verses and stop and pause, and then read a few more, stop and pause. And just, we're going to read through um, the passage together, making some comments as we go. Verse 1, for you, for you yourselves know, brothers that our coming to you is not in vain. 
But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Paul starts by by mentioning to them that that when he came to Thessalonica, he had come from Philippi where he had already suffered and been shamefully treated. It's like saying, we were treated awful and bad before we got to you. Now, the the Thessalonian believers are being treated awful and bad. So you say, what's happening to you is happening to us before we got there. But as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God. So he says, even in that, when we came, we declared with boldness to you the gospel, um, even amidst much conflict, which we talked about last week and how he was chased himself, he was chased right out of town. For our appeal, verse 3, for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, So we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with word of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. I'm going to pause there. What he finishes with there, the last part of verse 6, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Paul and his team could have come in and as they got established, acted like they were Mr. Big Shot. Uh, Mr. Big Shot who needed to be dealt with with um, appropriate sense of authority, rightly honored, dealt with with the... um, all that should come along with somebody who was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He said, we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. And before that, he was talking about his message and how it, it wasn't from any negative source. There was no negative motive. There was no negative additive. But they spoke to please God who will test their hearts. And so he said to them, you know, we, we came being treated poorly before we got to you. And now they're being treated poorly. It reminds them, you know, when when we were there, we just boldly spoke to you the gospel. We boldly spoke that to you um, from pure hearts. We boldly spoke that to you to please God and not to please man and not for any other extraneous reason. It was real simple what we did and real simple why We did it. He says that we didn't make demands as apostles, going on into verse 7. And we'll we'll visit back here in in a few minutes. He says, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also ourselves, because you had become very dear to us. I love those couple of verses because um, he talks about the heart of uh, a pastor, especially his heart for the Thessalonians, but really the the heart of every pastor ought to be this way. And it's not just pastors. This can be reflective of the heart that we all have for those that we might have an influence of Christ towards. That we want to be gentle and care. We want to treat them great and right. And he, he says, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. He, he pivots there in verse 9 and, and 12, and he reminds them of specifically of three other things that they saw while he was there with them, he and his team. He said, for you remember, brothers, one, our labor and toil, we worked day and night, I'm oh, sorry, night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we, were, while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. Paul and his team, they were tent-making missionaries. They would go and they would set up shop. They would make and mend tents and they would make money so that they didn't have to uh, put a financial burden onto this early church as it got itself in its very initial stages. He wasn't taking a salary. 
And he reminds them of that. He says, you, you know how we worked hard among you. Verse 10, he says, you are witnesses and God also of how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. So here's the second thing. He says, you remember the way we worked among you. And 10, he says, number two, you remember the way we were holy and blameless in how we acted with you, how we conducted ourselves toward you. And the third, the third thing he reminds them of in, in verse 11, he says, for you, you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. He exhorted and he encouraged and he charged them. So, he challenged them. He had been holy among them. He had worked hard among them. When he, when he was with them, he cared about them gently like a, like a nursing mother cares for her children or for her child. He spoke with boldness and plainness, proclaiming the gospel of God to them and doing it fr from a simple and pure heart to please God and not man, who would judge his heart. And that is the summary, in reverse, of, of those 12 verses. So, he didn't write to build himself up. He didn't write to, to do a, uh, a puff piece of how, how he wanted to be remembered because, gosh, he was great and those were great days. He was repairing and re-knitting their memory of him as it was being tore down by those who were opposing the church, opposing the gospel, and looking to destroy it all. And in the process of so doing, we're looking to tear down Paul as well. Now, we could talk about the, the history involved in that, and we could talk about the particulars of each of those aspects of things. But I want to today, I want to focus in on the two images, the pictures that Paul gives us in this passage of the way he ministered when he was among them. And uh, the first one is this. That Paul was gentle like a nursing mother with her children. Paul was gentle with them like a nursing mother with her children. That's the first point on your note sheet or in the app if you're using it. And think about that image. This is about a, a very tender, protecting, providing kind of love. Like a, like a mother who is nursing a baby. Paul says, we were gentle in that way with you. What a, what a statement about the way that he cared for them. That, that there's a protectiveness in that. There's a tenderness in that. There's a desire to be fully providing and fully caring for in every single way. He said, we, we love you in this way. And he goes on there, and, it, it, and it's listed under, underneath this on the note sheet. He says, uh, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you the gospel of God in our own selves, our lives as well. That's how it's translated, I believe, in the NIV. Because you had become very dear to us. I just remember those days in our family when we had little babies instead of teenagers. In those early days, you know, certainly father is, you know, important, but man, the mom is everything. The mom is everything, and she is so, um, <laughs> well, it's just amazing, it's an amazing time to, to watch a, a, a woman care for, and love her newborn baby. Gentle, like Paul says, is, is, doesn't even begin to, to cut it, <laughs> you know? It's a bunch of different words that come to mind. And I think of our families who are in that season of life, I'm sure that, that the, the, the dads in that situation, as they've, they're observing their wives, they could, they could talk about it um, with, a lot more, with a lot more clarity right now because they're in the middle of it. But that's a picture for all of us of the way that Paul loved these people 
and loved this church, his kind of parental love and his parental ministry in the way that he saw them. And so he, he had affectionate desire for them that was behind, that was in the way that he wanted to proclaim to them the gospel of God, but also in how he wanted to share his life with them. He and his team came and they sat down and they, they shared everything with them. They were working, making their own way, ministering the gospel to them, sharing and teaching and sharing life with them. It was a whole life 360 time, a whole life 360 kind of thing. You know, the body of Christ can be like that in a beautiful way, in seasons. There are times where the body is this 360 wonderful experience. I love the picture of Paul loving the church, leading the church, serving the church with gentleness and tenderness, providing for like a, like a, like a mom caring for her newborn child. That's one of the ways Paul loved this church. But a few verses later, there's another way. In verse 11 and 12, Paul writes that like a father with his children, he exhorted, encouraged, and charged them. He exhorted, encouraged, and charged them. And if you're, if, if you're thinking about it, I was, what was the word that summarizes all of that for me? It is challenged. He challenged them. That's not perfect. It's not perfect. But like a nursing mother, there's a love that was gentle and affectionate that led to the pouring out of their life in the serving of this church. On the other hand, there was this challenging nature that came from him as well, like a father to his sons or like a father to sons and daughters today who would challenge them to walk in a manner worthy of God challenged them to walk in a manner worthy of God who had called who had called them into his own kingdom and glory. I just want to stop and think about those two pictures in the life of the church that there is to be pastoral love if it's to be like Paul in this in this instance there's to be pastoral love that is gentle like a nursing mother caring for her newborn children, and that is challenging, like a father who is exhorting, encouraging, and charging his son and daughter. Here is how we are to live. We are to walk in a manner worthy of God. We're to walk in a manner worthy of God. Those two things, Think about them in the way that they uh, could express themselves in leadership in a church. Now, here's the thing. What is the stewardship of your own life? What is the stewardship of your own life spiritually where you could extend spiritual care and influence? And this is why I wanted to pull out these two pictures. It's not just to talk about Paul and his ministry there. I wanted to encourage us to think about our own ministry and lives in this way. Who, who you got? Someone might say, well, I'm a dad and I, I have a couple kids. Okay, great. Someone else might say, uh, I'm a mom, but my kids, they are grown. Great. Someone else, Am I, not, I, don't, I don't have kids. I'm not even married. Great. Who's in your circle, though, that you could have an influence on for the sake of Christ? Is there somebody that you have in your life that, that you're able to be a, a Christian influence to? Is there somebody in your life that you're able to maybe be an alongside partner with? Do, do any of us have those relationships? Or maybe I could say it this way, do all of us have those relationships? Because I think we all do. And if we don't, I think it's a time to recognize maybe we should. We're not called to live alone. The entirety of the New Testament and the way it commands us to live is plural. We're not called to live alone. We're not called to do it alone. We're not called to be isolated. The body of Christ and the Christian experience is communal. Now, I know this is a recording that's being watched by people who are at home, and I, I just want to encourage you in two ways. Number one, I want to encourage you to think about how does this play in my life? Who do I exercise the, have the possibility to exercise a spiritual influence with? 
Okay, well, there's a place where you have a spiritual stewardship for loving like Paul did to the Thessalonian church, for loving as a gentle, nursing mother, caring for a child that you want to nurture. You want to nurture and help see people formed in their faith, formed in Christ in that way, like a, like a gentle, nursing mom with her little baby. But you also... With, with those same relationships, want to be able to challenge like a father would. And a specific challenge Paul, Paul gives them to walk in a manner worthy of God. He says, that's what, I, that's what I encouraged. That's what I exhorted. That's what I called you to. We're to join with me and we're to walk in a manner worthy of God. But in your stewardship, in your relationships, and I'll take it a little bit further. In your marriage, with your kids, or if you have a spiritual influence with those in your family, maybe with siblings, you, you are the spiritual influencer, maybe with your parents or, or some other extended family, maybe with people who are not your family but ought to be, I'm sorry, who are not your family but, but are also in that kind of circle um, in the way that you could think about your life. Yeah, well, we're not blood-related, but we're, we're, we're close. We're in relationship. A great way to think about it is in your small group. In your small group, as you look to walk together and, and, and sharpen one another for Christ, there's to be this sense of like this nurturing love that is tender, and is providing, that is fully protecting. We want to we shelter you and help you to grow. We want to help build this, um, this idea of a greenhouse and see you grow and flourish. We want to be gentle with you. And we also want to exhort and encourage and call. We want to we challenge those in our lives to walk in a manner worthy of God and to do that together. Now, there's a really great, very specific way to hang this on, on a verse in this passage. If you want to take one to walk away with you, uh, take one as you walk away from this this morning, um, a great verse to memorize, a great verse to think on is um, verse, verses uh, 8 and 9 here. Excuse me, verses 7 and 8 here. He says, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. I want to share the gospel of God, but also ourselves. I like the NIV's translation here, but, our, but also our lives as well, our own lives as well, because you had become very dear to us. Have both of those, gospel proclamation, but also the sharing of life together because you love these people. Just like Paul had gospel proclamation and the sharing of his life because he loved those people. We can live into that same, into that same picture, into that same image. I think that's a very biblical way to think about how it is we could look to live and lead and look to pastor, but look to influence, look to, look to be alongside one another, to have these two poles to our love for one another in Christ, the gentle nurture of a mom caring for her, her newborn and the strong challenge of a father looking to raise a high bar for his children to see, hey, we want to walk and live up here. We are not content to walk and live right down there. But I'd like to take just a second and step back to the broader picture, which is that this last year has us, um, some of us, but I think most of us in different ways, but some of us more than others, living individualized, disconnected lives in ways we never have before. Living separated from others for the sake of not receiving and transmitting virus. 
everybody has their own situations. Everybody has their own circumstances. Like I said, if you come here on a Sunday morning, you're going to find people wearing their masks. And we mentioned it probably at the beginning of this Sunday service. I didn't hear. You're at home. But I think that's important. And everybody's got to do what's right in their situation. But listen, I want to encourage you to think about the muscle memory that we're losing right now. The muscle memory of being together, sacrificially spending time with one another. Sort of think about the, the things we've left behind that you miss, that you want to get back to. And I want to encourage you to think about, can you get back to it yet? I think there are people at home um, watching this, but, but in our church and in every church, people who are doing this that, that are at home and they probably need to have, ne have needed to stay home. They've needed to be careful. They're being very consistent in their life, but because they're not working anywhere but outside the home and they have, they have real significant medical reasons to do it. Yes and amen. Truth is, though, there's a lot of us that are, gone, that are back to work and back to work in public ways and back to work in places where we're mixing with people. A lot of us are doing things in our lives, well, maybe not right now where it's oh so cold, but in the fall, here again coming in the spring, you know, sports stuff with kids, um, normal activities that we normally do. As it's possible, some of us are finding our way to those things. And I just want to ask you, if you're finding your way to those things, why are you not yet finding your way here? Why are you not finding your way yet to church? If you're doing those other things, is it time for you to think about doing this too in person with the people that have a communal experience of this together with your small group? together. I know that, that there's, a, that there's a, a different threshold that each of us have. I respect it. Very much I respect it. But I do think it's time to say, is it time for you to make some adjustments? Is it time for you to make some shifts? Put a mask on and go be together. As soon as you're able, get outside and be together. Find the ways to be together. We are to be together because if we're not together, if we're not in relationship, and you can do that through Zoom, absolutely. You can do that through all the, the means that we have available to us through technology, 100%. But if you have nobody in your life who either you can look at and, and think about, I want to I wanna help see Christ formed in them. I have a gentle concern for them, a gentle regard for them, like a, like a mom with a baby. I want to help them grow. Or, or that same view, like I have this other poll. I want to help to challenge them to see that there's something more for them here. I want to help them grow. If you don't have anybody in your life that you can be looking at in that way, you're missing out on an important part of your, what Christianity is. It's communal. Maybe it's the reverse. Maybe you're here and you're like, I don't think I could, I don't have anything to give anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm a new Christian. I'm, I'm not mature as a Christian. I've not grown. I can't really look to shepherd somebody else. I need the, I need the shepherding. Great. Well, then turn the whole thing in reverse. And, and do you need that gentle, nurturing love in Christ? Do you need that challenging, calling up love in Christ? You need to find that in relationship with each other. This isn't it. This is not good enough. You need to have it in relationship with people. Is it time for you to step back further into your relationships or into new ones? I'll leave that at that. Last thing I want to mention here, and it's the last thing on the note sheet, if you're looking at that in the app, is that Paul was entirely about the good news in word and deed. This passage, this 12 verses, has, has um, this really great little phrase about the good news. Because here, Paul repeatedly uses the words, the gospel of God. Verse 2, he says, we have boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God. We have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. That's verse 4. In verse 8, he writes, We were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. And finally, in verse 9, he says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we, were, while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. 
It's tough to get the right shot up here. That's not, you can't see the whole cross. There's a cross behind me. Paul's ministry, both in word and deed, was about the gospel of God. The good news of God. That a Savior had come, had lived the life that we should live. Sinless. Fully righteous. Living up to being created in God's image. And what that ought to entail is a life that is fully lived in worship. One came who was fully merit, meritous of that. And he died on the cross in our place for our sins. But he rose from the grave. And his resurrection from the grave filled his death on the cross with meaning. Because he became the Passover lamb that God's people from of old had been looking forward to. He was the perfect Passover lamb, slain for the sins of his people. And so now, what he wrote in another one of his letters, in in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, it's for our sake that God made him, Jesus Christ, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God sent the one who knew no sin, Jesus, on the cross to be sin for us, to become sin for us, to bear the fullness of sin for us, so that in him, trusting in him, being found in him, having faith in him, becoming no longer in Adam, living for ourselves, but being converted and be now, now being in Christ and living unto God, living lives worthy of God, seeking towards that ideal. That those who have been brought into Christ have become the righteousness of God. God sees us as the righteousness that Jesus possessed. And that's the gospel. And I'm sure that's not the very best way of presenting it ever, but that is the truth. That's the good news, that you are in sin in your own resources, and you are dead in your sin in your own resources, spiritually dead, dead to God, and without the grace of God in Jesus, separated from God, and, and, and dead to God forever in an eternity separated from Him in hell. That's awful. That is the bad news. But the good news is that that is not your story. If you have heard the truth about Jesus, who he was, what he did, and what he did for you on the cross, and his victorious resurrection, and that now he's ascended on high and he is seated at the right hand of God, where he waits to return in victory. Paul was entirely about the good news in word and deed. So in in these 12 verses, he reminds them of his deeds. He reminds them of the way that his words came to them. But but in everything, Paul was a gospel messenger. And Paul took that gospel message forward in a way that was of great sacrifice to him, but left great fruit behind growing up in the life of the Thessalonian church. Last thing, in a different place, in a different letter, Paul says this. He says to to the Galatians, actually, he says, "My, my children, for whom I am again in the pains of child, whom I am again in in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. God's design is for Christ to be formed in you. And if you have 30 years left, that is 30 years that God would have you to be walking to live in a life worthy of God that Christ might be formed in you by the power of God. That's a spiritual, supernatural gift. But God desires no less for you. 
And he gives us the church to be part of that for us. We are to grow in the, the greenhouse that is the church. Don't allow your TV or your phone or Zoom to become your I'm good substitute for church. You miss being here. Oh, I'm glad. Is it time for you to begin to take those next steps? I'm concerned that while there are some, I'm sure I know, who need to continue doing what they're doing because they're doing it wholeheartedly through their whole life. There are, not, there are a lot of other people who are just more comfortable staying home on Sundays. Which one are you? Put yourself in the place where believers can look at you and you can look at them and have a gentleness as a newborn mother looking to care for your spiritual development or you looking to care for theirs. Put yourself in the place with other believers where someone can be looking at you through the, through the lens of, of challenging you up like a father would his children to live a life worthy of God or where you can be that person challenging somebody else. The way that Paul had a parental love and ministry for the Thessalonians is a wonderful picture for us of the togetherness that is required in the body of Christ and in the Christian life. So it's a good morning to maybe throw a reminder of that out there. And I hope you receive that in the spirit that is offered. And there's no condemnation attached, but there is a question of challenge there. Is it time for you to begin making steps to being with people more thoroughly or more thickly than you've been able to thus far? And are there new are ways you can do it? Can you put on a mask? I don't know. The news says people put on three masks, whatever. Can you find ways to do it? We need each other. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for the technology. I thank you for the, the foolishness of preaching, that Paul, Paul calls it. I pray you would, by your spirit, take your word and plant it deep in our hearts that we might bear fruit and that we might grow. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. And, and for the last word this morning, I'm just going to turn and read the verse I finished up, up with there in Galatians chapter 4. Paul says, My little children, for who I am again in the anguish of childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. Have a great Sunday, Christian. Thank you for being with us.